In this segment, I'm going to talk about gastric secretion, that is, secretion from the stomach. Looking at the stomach, there are four principal cells that I'm going to be discussing. The first one is called the parietal cell, and the parietal cell is responsible for secreting hydrochloric acid and a substance called intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor is essential for the absorption of vitamin B12. Chief cells are responsible for secreting pepsinogen. Mucous cells secrete a bicarbonate-rich mucus, and G cells secrete gastrin. Gastrin circulates through the blood and triggers parietal cells to secrete acid and also triggers ECL cells to secrete histamine. Histamine also triggers the acid secretion from parietal cells and the parasympathetic nervous system, ACH through muscarinic ACH receptors, triggers acid secretion. And if we look here, we can see these pits in the lining of the stomach. In these pits, we see parietal cells. Down deeper, we see chief cells. And then we also see mucus secreting cells. Right along the pit in the neck region, we see mucus secreting cells. And along the surface, we also see mucus secreting cells. Now let's take a look at these acid secreting cells in more detail. Here's the parietal cell, which secretes acid. It's triggered by gastrin, it's triggered by ACH, and triggered by histamine. ECL cells, these enterochromaffin-like cells, are also triggered by ACH and gastrin to release even more histamine. Parietal cells are inhibited by somatostatin and, as we'll see, prostaglandins also. These parietal cells are found in the fundus, this is the upper region, and the corpus, or body, of the stomach. Down in the antrum, the lower part of the stomach, we find G cells and D cells. G cells secrete gastrin. They are stimulated by GRP from the enteric nervous system, and they're also stimulated by high pH, an alkaline environment in the stomach, and by the presence of amino acids. All of these trigger gastrin secretion. The gastrin then, in turn, secretes more acid and causes the secretion of histamine, which enhances acid secretion. So when you eat a meal and the pH rises and we begin to see proteins being broken down into amino acids, the high pH in amino acids then trigger gastrin, which then triggers more hydrogen secretion to try to bring the pH back down again. Under low pH conditions, we find D cells secreting somatostatin. Somatostatin will inhibit gastrin secretion and also inhibit hydrogen ion secretion. By inhibiting gastrin secretion, we reduce the stimulus and then also by inhibiting directly the parietal cells. We reduce hydrogen ion secretion by a greater amount. Between meals, the gastric luminal pH can be less than 2. That then triggers somatostatin secretion from these D cells, which inhibits gastrin secretion. In addition, the low pH has a direct effect on inhibiting gastrin secretion, and that then decreases hydrochloric acid secretion. At very low pHs, we don't want to be triggering more acid secretion. Now, during the meal, the food and drink that you are ingesting is going to neutralize the acids in the stomach, raising the pH up to 5 or 6. This then decreases secretion of somatostatin, which then increases gastrin secretion, takes the break of the G cells, and of course the high pH directly affects gastrin secretion. So gastrin secretion rises, acid secretion then also rises to try to bring the pH down. There are three phases of gastric secretion. The cephalic phase, which comes from the brain, is triggered by thinking about food, by smelling food, or even putting food in your mouth and tasting it. These things will trigger gastric secretion even before food enters the stomach. The parasympathetic nervous system then triggers another nervous system called the enteric nervous system to release ACH on the ECL cells and the parietal cells to trigger acid secretion. It also, through the enteric nervous system, releases GRP to trigger G cells to release gastrin, and through ACH inhibits D cells. So these parasympathetic influences begin the acid secreting in the stomach even before food enters the stomach, in anticipation of food entering the stomach. The gastric phase occurs when food actually enters the stomach. So we continue with parasympathetic activity, triggering histamine, and triggering acid secretion. This is all the same process as we see in the cephalic phase. In addition, mechanoreceptors will trigger the enteric nervous system to enhance acid secretion and trigger 
the enteric nervous system to increase gastrin secretion. And mechanoreceptors also send signals to the CNS, which then feeds back on the parasympathetic nervous system. Also, as the food enters the stomach, the rise in pH and the increase in amino acid concentration in the stomach will also enhance the secretion of gastrin. The last phase is called the intestinal phase. In the intestinal phase, the fats and amino acids entering the stomach are triggering cholecystokinin from eye cells. Cholecystokinin enhances the closing of the pyloric sphincter to allow the food that's in the duodenum here to exit before the sphincter opens to allow another bolus chyme into the duodenum. CCK also inhibits motility of the stomach and increased acid triggers a hormone called secretin or secretin, depending on your pronunciation, from S cells, which inhibits G cells. So when the food enters the intestines, the activity of these enterogestrones, these hormones, are to slow down what's happening in the stomach. In a parietal cell, the three stimulants, gastrin, histamine, and ACH, work through second messages, histamine, through adenylate cyclase and cyclic AMP, gastrin and ACH through phospholipase and IP3 to phosphorylate and trigger the movement of these vesicles to fuse with the membrane and to place more of these hydrogen potassium pumps onto the membrane. More hydrogen potassium pumps fused with the membrane leads to increased hydrogen secretion into the lumen of the stomach. Once again, I'm showing this very important chemical reaction, CO2 plus water, leading to bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. The bicarbonate is exchanged for chloride. So now we're beginning to increase chloride concentration in the cell, which moves down its electrochemical gradient along with potassium into the stomach. We're beginning to see a rise in potassium chloride in the stomach, but potassium chloride is useless in the stomach. So what has to happen now is the potassium has to be removed from the lumen of the stomach. It's pumped back into the parietal cells in exchange for hydrogen ions. This potassium then is free to leak back out, pump back in, leak back out, and so on. This continues moving, leading to a high hydrogen ion concentration in the stomach. So there's very little potassium. Most of the contents of the stomach are now going to be hydrochloric acid, hydrogen ions and chloride. There's a drug called cimetidine, which is an H2 histamine receptor blocker. We find that in some over-the-counter drugs like uh, Tagamet. And it's a competitive inhibitor for this histamine. Because it's a competitive inhibitor, histamine is able to dislodge cimetidine from the H2 receptor and continue the production of cyclic AMP. Cimetidine-containing drugs must be replaced frequently. Atropine is a muscarinic ACH inhibitor, but atropine would not be used therapeutically in this condition because atropine has many, many side effects, including cardiac and GI. So it's not used as a therapeutic agent in blocking acid secretion. Omeprazole irreversibly binds to this potassium hydrogen pump and inhibits this pump. The only way to remove omeprazole is to internalize through endocytosis, bring these pumps back in, and then degrade them, and replace them with new, fresh HK ATPase pumps. So omeprazole, because it irreversibly binds to this pump, will last 12 to 24 hours. So in addition to the cyclic AMP production by histamine, somatostatin inhibits adenylate cyclase and prostaglandins, prostaglandin E2, also through an inhibitory G protein inhibits the histamine production. So an interesting side effect of aspirin therapy is that aspirin blocks prostaglandin synthesis, which is why it reduces fever, because prostaglandin E2 raises the hypothalamic set point, the thermostatic set point. Aspirin inhibits the prostaglandin synthesis, and therefore fever tends to come down. Thyroxin A2 is a prostaglandin derivative, and aspirin inhibits prostaglandins. Therefore, clotting is impeded and is one of the reasons for aspirin therapy. But as a side effect, because it inhibits prostaglandins, it removes this breaking action, which can cause hyperacidity in the stomach. So people with duodenal ulcers might not want to be taking aspirin as an anticoagulant. Pepsinogen secretion at chief cells is triggered by ACH and CCK, and at this point I will point out that CCK and gastrin are from the same family. 
So CCK receptors are weakly sensitive to gastrin, and gastrin receptors are also weakly sensitive to CCK. So these two mechanisms work by increasing calcium concentration. Calcium is essential in the binding of vesicles to the membrane. Catecholamines like norepinephrine and VIP and secretin work through cyclic AMP mechanisms to increase protein kinase A to phosphorylate the vesicles and therefore enhance the movement and fusion of these vesicles to the membrane. Somatostatin once again inhibits cyclic AMP production by an inhibitory G protein. Once the pepsinogen is in the lumen of the stomach, the high hydrogen ion concentration begins to cleave the protective amino acids creating pepsin. Because pepsin is a protease, pepsin enhances the production of more pepsin from pepsinogen in a positive feedback mechanism. Pepsin, because it's a protease, breaks protein down into peptides. The reason for this high acidity in the stomach is to help denature these proteins. Proteins that are bound up in their tertiary structure resist enzymatic degradation. If we can unfold the proteins and open up the binding sites so that pepsin can start cleaving these proteins into smaller peptides, even amino acids, we begin the process of protein digestion, which will continue in the intestines. So let's look at mucus secretion. First, we put always sodium potassium ATPase pumps on our epithelial cells and our open potassium channels. These cells, these mucus secreting cells, are triggered by ACH. ACH causes an increase in calcium concentration through a second messenger IP3. Prostaglandins inhibit. And again, CO2 and water leads to bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. Bicarbonate is exchanged for chloride ions, so we're beginning to develop a high bicarbonate concentration at the apical surface of these mucus secreting cells. The chloride that comes in just simply moves down its electrochemical gradient and back into the blood. Peptides and water are released, which form the mucus. This mucus develops a thick layer along the surface of the epithelial cells. The apical membrane is loaded with glycoproteins that form a glycocalyx, a bushy-like substance which traps the mucus and holds it, allows it to adhere to the apical membrane of the epithelial cells. So there's a very thick, high adherence layer close to the apical cells. It becomes looser adhering as we move out toward the lumen. So although the pH in the stomach is about 2, when we get to the apical membrane, it becomes approximately 7, which is approximately neutral pH. And that's because of this bicarbonate-rich mucus. The glycoprotein polymerize into this mucus, this very thick mucus, giving it a very gel-like substance. It needs to be very thick, and it needs to adhere to the apical membrane in order to keep from being washed away by the activity of the stomach. Well, this is the mucus layer here attached to the luminal side. We see lots of phospholipids. Many of these phospholipids are bound to glycoproteins so that the hydrophobic ends are facing the lumen. The pH in the lumen is about 2. Chloride and hydrogen ions, because of this hydrophobic barrier, are inhibited from entering the gel-like substance here. So there's this thick mucus, very thick along here, much looser as we move out here. Chloride and hydrogen ions, however, can penetrate this barrier. As the chloride ions come in, they are exchanged for bicarbonate through this CO2 and water mechanism once again. Chloride ions and hydrogen ions then move out into the cirrhosis side, re-enter the blood. The bicarbonate then picks up hydrogen ions and produces CO2 and water. The result of all of this is that the pH near the apical membrane is about 7. The CO2 that's produced will re-enter the cell and create more bicarbonate, and that bicarbonate can be exchanged for chloride once again, and the system just keeps on producing a nice alkaline environment. Also, because of the pH of 7, pepsin is almost completely inactive at pHs of 7. Pepsin's optimal pH tends to be around 2. So when pepsin enters this mucus layer, it's becoming less and less active until it reaches the apical membrane. Its activity is virtually zero, Therefore, it will not digest away these proteins along that membrane. So this is one mechanism to stop the stomach from digesting itself. Reduce the hydrochloric acid concentration 
raise the pH near the membrane to avoid erosion of this membrane, inactivate pepsin to avoid the breakdown of proteins on the membrane, helps to protect the stomach from digesting itself. Well, that concludes this lecture on gastric secretion.